And we are now live. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to go ahead and call to order our meeting of Brawley City Council and successor agency, the Brawley Community Redevelopment Agency. Our regular meeting today, Tuesday, August 4th, 2020 at 6 p.m. And we are meeting uh, using a Zoom video capabilities. And we'll go ahead and do roll call. Mayor uh, Norma kastner Howdigy. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Luke Hamby. Here. Council Member George A. Nava. Here. Council Member Sam Couchman. Here. Uh, the record will reflect that uh, Council Member Donald Wharton is not present this evening. Okay, thank you. We'll go ahead and move on to approval of our agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as written. This is George. I'll second it. This is Sam. Okay. Motion, um, motion by George, Councilman Nava and seconded by Councilman Couchman. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to item number two, public appearances and comments, not to exceed four minutes. This is a time for the public to address the council on any item not appearing on the agenda that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. And I did receive a public comment in writing. I don't know if we have anybody there, Rosanna, or any other public comments? Uh, there are no members of the public present uh, this evening. We do have a printed copy of the letter available if it's uh, something uh, that we can assist with. Yes, I have the letter in front of me and the um, letter was submitted by Mr. Ryan Rebillard, uh president of the Brawley Youth Football and Cheer. Uh, and he requested that we read this into the uh, meeting notes. So I'll go ahead and do that now. The letter is addressed to uh, the subject Brawley Youth Football and Cheer consideration dated August 1st, addressed to the Brawley City Council. And it uh, says, Mayor Norma Kastner Howdigy and Council, during these times we are all living in, one thing is for sure, our youth are not participating in sports. The community of Brawley has produced many great leaders, business professionals, military veterans, doctors, nurses, teachers, and much more. Our society learns leadership, teamwork, discipline, social skills, camaraderie, compassion, and much more from sports. Brawley youth have had their in-class education and sports stripped away since March. Parks and recreation activities, Little League baseball, club sports, and more. Now, kids are traveling out of Imperial County and sometimes out of California to participate in sports. The youth within our community have excelled in the classroom, on the playing fields, courts, wrestling mats, track, and swimming pools. Their coaches are true life role models, sometimes father, mother figures to these kids. Personally, I have played for youth coaches who I still look up to and admire to this day. As a coach, it's not about wins and losses, it's about developing and guiding the youth. We all want to win, but we also experience losses and learn from them. The, Bra the city of Brawley has Ed Soto Field dedicated for use as a football field, soccer field, and much more. It is the only field within the Imperial Valley that is not owned or maintained by its local high school. The city of Brawley, along with Brawley Youth Football and Cheer, have the opportunity to exclusively allow and offer youth sports in the Imperial County. Together, we can be on the forefront and showing other communities how we can return to play. Our insurance carrier, Sattler Insurance, along with USA Football and other associations throughout the region and country, have guided us in providing return to play guidelines and parent guidelines and safety information handouts that Brawley Youth Football is committed to adhering to in order to return to play. I am requesting that the Brawley City Council allows Brawley Youth Football to use the Ed Sotko Field. Some of the guidelines and precautions include a designated entrance and exit for our participants and volunteers, a signage promoting proper hygiene, hand washing stations with up to 14 spigots for our kids, 
disinfecting protocols and limited player to coach ratio. These are only a few examples of the preventative measures we have in place. If a decision cannot be made tonight, I respectfully ask you to have a call to action at the next meeting or perhaps a special meeting. I understand the Raleigh City Council plans on going dark for the remainder of the month, and I would like to provide ample time to train our kids should we be allowed to use the Ed Soto Field. In closing, the City of Raleigh has an opportunity to allow youth sports to return at a local park. City Council can offer guidance and support to allow this to happen. We cannot say no to these children and wait for other government officials to dictate when it can happen. We will work together to ensure our community sets the standard in allowing youth sports to return in a safe, healthy manner. Thank you, signed Ryan A. Reboyar, President, Raleigh Youth Football and Cheer. Um, thank you, Mr. Reboyar, for submitting this for, to the City Council for consideration. Um, since this is public comment period, we would not, don't normally take any action on, on these, but we definitely will take into consideration the information that you have submitted to us and route it to the appropriate uh, department for consideration. Okay. Uh, does anyone have anything else to say regarding the public comments? Okay, if not, we'll move on. Again, thank you. Okay, um, we're going to move on to item number three, our consent agenda. Items are approved by one motion. You have the is opportunity it, to review the consent agenda. This is George. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as written. This is Sam. I second. Okay. Motion by Councilman uh, George Nava, seconded by Councilman Sam Couchman. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Okay. Thank you. The motion carries. Okay, moving on to item number four, continued public hearing for state administered CDBG, CDBG, CV application. Rosanna, anything? Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor kessner Uh We do have our development services director who is prepared to assist with this continued public hearing. Uh, this item was originally scheduled to be heard at our last meeting, and as information has continued to evolve um, with reference to eligibility, uh, the, the item was delayed to uh, this evening for action. And with that, I will hand off to Gordon Gaist, our Development Services Director, who oversees CDBG program activities. Good evening, Mr. Gaist. Members. Oh, sorry. Good evening, council members. Uh, Gordon Gaist, uh, Development Services Director. As uh, <clears throat> on the first opening of this public hearing on the last uh, uh, meeting, uh, we received direction from uh, the council to focus on the opportunity to uh, to. Uh, assist with utility building for seniors, which uh, falls within the parameters of this grant. Um, I did some uh, some basic research uh, with, with a, a small sampling of bills. Uh, if you want me to elaborate on that, uh, how, mu how much uh, it usually comes out. It, I surveyed about five different senior households and got a good, uh, good sampling of uh, what the average billing would be, and then uh, subtracting the admin fee, how, how many households we can actually help, if you would want me to elaborate on that. Yes, please. Okay, so uh, we, we from our, our water department, um, we, we got a, an average bill of $162 a month throughout the year. Uh, of course, it, since we're, we're kind of doing this in the summer and doing a three month uh, retro or three month forward, it is, it is usually a little higher during that time. Uh, that's gonna apply to the electric too. Uh, the average electric would be about 125 
but in the summer it's probably you know closer to to 150 160. Uh, your gas uh, average for the year is only fourteen dollars. That one's it ranges anywhere from nine to seventeen, basically. Uh, that, that's that's a, a small one. Uh, phone again, that that's kind of a, an interesting one because not many people have landlines anymore. Landline by itself isn't that expensive. It's only maybe you know like twenty twenty five bucks. But if you have cell phones, you know, it could run up to more. Some of these people do have the subsidized phones, so some of them don't pay anything or very, very little. Uh, I don't know if, if you wanted to include uh, uh, internet and cable on this too, since it's not essential. Well, some people think internet is essential, and it is. A lot of, a lot of the seniors have it, mostly for their, their kids that come over to visit. Um, and you know that, that's something that usually runs about seventy bucks a month for for internet. So overall, you know, you're going to come out to an average of anywhere between, uh, you know, probably a maximum of about and at maximum average of about four hundred dollars a month, and a minimum average of about three fifty six. So with that number, you could probably help about. Um, I did the math here. Hold on, give me a second. Anywhere between 263 to 300 households. And if I may add to Mr. Gay's comments, so the city is eligible for an allocation of $126,725. Of that award of funds, the city uh, can be reimbursed up to 17% of administrative expenses uh, for carrying out the program. Uh, this program um, as defined this evening would allow for individuals who are senior citizens to qualify uh, based on uh, the uh, a self-certification process uh, that validates the the age of the individual who is the customer of record so this is a, a great way to assist uh, local senior uh, citizen households in the city of Raleigh and uh, by uh, approaching the program in this fashion, uh, we'll be preparing uh, a application to CDBG. Uh, one of the requirements prior to the application being submitted is uh, the need to hold a public hearing. So uh, this evening we are here to share with you what we're proposing to use the program dollars for and uh, open the public hearing and see if any members of the public would like to weigh in on the current proposed activity. Okay. So with that, if it's the wishes of the council, um, staff suggests opening the public hearing. Yes, That's, um, you don't need a motion for that, right? We just open the hearing, yes. Yes, thank you. And we'll give them a few minutes to see if anybody calls in or texts. If it, will we get right. any comments or? Norm, I think you need to state that you're opening the public hearing, I believe. Okay. Okay, uh, at this time, we're gonna go ahead and open the public hearing for the state administered CDBG, CDBG, CV application. And um, the record will reflect that the city has not received any written comments in advance of this evening's public hearing, nor are there any members of the public present in our open city council chambers this evening. I have um, looked at posted comments on the hub just to check in and see if by chance there are any comments there and none are listed at this time. Madam, Madam Mayor. Yes. If I may, um, I would like to see us maybe concentrate on the basic services and maybe not cover everything that that um, that we mentioned there at the start of the presentation. I think uh, the basics to me are, you know, your water, uh, your sewer, uh, your electrical. I don't know if we want to go into cell phones, the internet, and all of that, that type of thing. I think we could serve more people. More people might be eligible if we were just going to concentrate on some basic services for them. And then we might have a wider group. In other words, we're talking about serving between 260 under the plan, 260 to 300, 
maybe we could serve 600 if we only covered the basic stuff. And it's easier to track, I think, because if we start tracking everybody's cell phone and everybody has a different type of coverage and everything like that, that's much more difficult for us to follow up on. And I'm not sure how payments would be made, but it seems to me that we should look at the basics first and see how many people we could we could handle. And then after that, then we can expand it. If we don't have enough applications or something like that, maybe we could go back and do a second round of funding for some of the extraordinary things that maybe seniors are, are, are purchasing or they need. I, I'm not saying that they don't need those services. It's just I think we could serve more if we just looked at basics, helping them out with the basics to begin with. So the program guidelines can carve out the specific um, eligible utilities. Uh, and as the parameters are defined by the state, the city will have the ability to address a max of 90 days of uh, services. So whether it's retro or um, looking into the future, the city actually will uh, receive requests for payment and then literally cut those checks in batches. So, so we will reimburse them for what they've already expended. Is that correct? It's not a reimbursement. It's actually written directly to the vendor. To the vendor. Okay. Mm -hmm. to the it's vendor. a direct okay. payment. Yeah. And that's a lot harder to track because you've got multiple vendors. And mm -hmm. so, uh, but if we concentrate on this, the basics, then we'd have the city services, we would have the IID and we would have the gas company mm -hmm. and we could look at those basics. And I think we could track that a lot better than we could like everything else that's going on out there. I don't know. I, I could be wrong, but that's what I would like to see us look at. Now, do we have? Do we have? I'm, I'm sorry. Do we have an idea of how many seniors we have in the city of Raleigh, or in family of seniors, maybe? Or do we have a, an approximate number that might be so, eligible? Um, we did a a look at the general demographics of our population. We don't necessarily track our current customers based on age. So what we would do is advertise the availability of the program. And then those who come in and self-certify, uh, matching up to an existing customer name, uh, their eligibility would be, would be based on um, that self-certification process. And as it stands, um, every CDBG funded activity has to meet a national objective and that which is oriented towards senior citizens as a group uh, automatically qualifies. So we have to just make sure that the party is in fact um, a senior citizen, that's the customer of record, and uh, then we have the ability to either work with them on their retro payments that they may have fallen behind on, knowing that um, state law right now has a reprieve on those utilities being shut off, so it gives people a chance to get caught up, or to help them on a going forward basis for that 90-day period and give them a, a boost in uh, taking care of those essential needs. Can we and give them a choice? I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to ask about the age. What, what, at what age do you do we use for determining the senior citizen category? I'm going to look quickly to see if I can um, give you an immediate answer. And if not, um, we will get back with the council based on the state guidelines is, is the driver for what uh, would define that criteria if it's 65 or older. We could just provide I believe it's 65 or older, but but we can get okay. <clears throat> Yeah, just uh, going by Mr. Couchman's uh, recommendation, if, if, you, if you so choose to uh, eliminate some of those more tentative type of bills like phone and cable, uh, mm -hmm. you can probably add another 50 people into the program. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good idea because um, you know, with phone and internet, a lot of times they're they're bundled, and it's hard to break apart. Um, you know, a person's home if they have a home a, a landline bundled with their internet through AT and T or or Spectrum or whatever, it's hard to break those apart. And so I, I agree with Sam that it should be, you know, the basic necessities so that mm -hmm. we can reach as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as I look through these guidelines for uh, CDBG COVID related funding. It actually, unfortunately, just says presumed benefit uh, limited uh, clientele, which is the national objective. It only states seniors generally. So we'll have to get back with you to confirm the age. Uh, I mean, it's not critical right now. We're going to put in an application and there's going to be some time frame to settle all those things. But uh, um, Right. Other, and, and, oh, 
And I think, you know, I, I agree with Sam. I mean, we can, we can get to that later, but we just maybe need to define the scope of um, the type of, uh, you know, assistance that will be provided. And would they have a choice on whether they wanted to go retro and cover those bills or whether they'd like to take it for the three months, you know, or whatever, however many our time frame, but would they have a choice in that when they apply? So an individual who's currently in arrears uh, would have to typically in our city operations would have to pay for the past due balances first unless different types of payment arrangements have been made. So the tip okay. would be to true up and get caught up if you're behind. If you're not behind, then uh, provided you are age qualifying, you have the ability uh, to, to basically tap this resource for a maximum of a total of 90 days. So let's say you're 30 days behind, you can use 30 of the days for the look back and you can use the 60 remaining days for those uh, bills that lie ahead. Okay. And the beauty of that is they can use that once they get that at that money to cover their bills, they may be able to have additional money to do the other services that they may need. And so, and also frees up some money for them probably for food and stuff if they need those kinds of things, because we can't supply food and things of that nature. So they may already be in, 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 in a, in a governmental program that does that, but maybe they're not. And so at least that gives them some leeway with some of their money and, and it might get them, and eventually they're gonna have to pay some of these bills in the long run anyway. So this would help them with that process. So I think it's, and I think it's more fair if we give it to more people rather than less than fewer people. And I think that, that makes sense to me. I mean, I don't know, that's just me talking. Do we um, need to kind of have a consensus on that to move forward uh, or? We're you happy to take direction. Your, your direction. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it might be also helpful to note uh, that countywide dialogue is in progress with all of the non entitlement cities, which is basically all of us with the exception of El Centro, uh, to look at how public services might be administered by one of us, one of our entities, as opposed to each one of us carrying out the work. Uh, it will bring that information to you in greater detail as it develops. Um, if we find that the fastest to accomplish is simply carrying out that activity in-house, uh, staff will be making that recommendation. But if there are economies of scale associated uh, with administration through one hub administrator, uh, the funds are there to assist with the cost of administration. Okay. Right. And, and you know, and with the COVID thing, you know, I mean, we don't we don't want 350 people coming to our office at one time. Obviously, this is going to have to be something that's planned well. If we're going to do it at the city, you know, we're going to administer just our our portion of the grant, or if we do it with the county, and they're going to have more of a, a centralized location where they can set up appointments or something. I mean, we could do that too, but that's going to be a, a you know a big rush of people that are going to be applying for this. So. So for the so for the benefit of the public that may be listening to this, um, when can we kind of anticipate that we will have some kind of a, a program application out for the public? Otherwise, we'll probably we'll start getting phone calls. Um, I, it is staff's recommendation that we first get through the submittal process because what, what still has to occur before that money is uh, approved for use, the city has to meet a deadline by the end of next month to submit for the drawdown. Uh, then the drawdown typically uh, produces an approval with the set of general conditions and special conditions. And it's only once those hurdles are cleared that the funds are um, available to be used for the approved purpose. So we've been assured by HCD that they're trying their best to expedite access. That's the whole point of these funds and resources is to have them put very quickly to use. Um, our normal CDBG programs can take uh, over six months to get through those hurdles. So we're, we're hopeful that this is a program that can roll out for actual use by the, the senior citizen community uh, before this calendar year comes to a close. Um, and, you know, I, I think if we can work rapidly with uh, the state to, to kind of push that agenda, almost all cities um, and the county have decided to focus on public services because the hurdles associated with all the other program activities, um, they present a lot of vulnerabilities for cities 
and, and agencies because of the certification requirements for each eligible household. So right. we're hopeful that we'll be faster to make this available to the public. Uh, probably the best case, absolute best case would be 90 days um, after submittal, uh, late August. Uh, the submittal date is the, the end of this month. Yeah, August 31st is the deadline for the, for the application. For the so submittal yeah, application. Even if they can expedite it to 30, I mean, it's not gonna happen at least until the beginning of October. That would be if they can even do it in, in 30 days, but more likely like uh, the city manager said, it's, it's probably more likely gonna be a little longer, which, which is still a lot faster than, you know, we normally go through grants, which takes several months, you know, six months right. or so to clear conditions. We, what we could do is inquire of HCD if we can start a like a, a reservation list, basically. That would work. Um, this is going to be first come first served. And I, you know, we imagine that it'll uh, very quickly be fully subscribed. Okay. okay. Any other so. comments from council? If nope. not, we're going to go ahead and go on to um, go ahead and close the public hearing. And uh, was anything submitted that you know of Rosanna during this time that we were talking? I will do one cross check on the posted comments. There were no comments received on the hub. Okay. Then we'll go ahead and move on to item 4A, which is the approval of the resolution number 2020, resolution of the City Council, City of Brawley, California, for a state administered CDBG, CDBG, CV application for funding and the execution of a grant agreement and any amendments thereto from the 2020 Community Development Block Grant Program, Coronavirus Response Round 1. NOFA dated June 5th, 2020. So I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve that resolution. This is Luke. Luke, okay. This is George, I'll second the motion. Okay, motion by Mayor Pro Tem Hamby, seconded by Council Member uh, George Nava. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to regular business. A update on the City of Brawley declaration of local emergency as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. And our first item on, on the regular business, we have uh, an invited guest, uh, an update by our, the CEO for Pioneers Memorial Healthcare District, Mr. Larry Lewis. And I believe he's in the room. So we could get him on board. Good afternoon, Mr. Lewis. Welcome. Thank you guys very much for allowing me on your agenda today. I appreciate it. I just wanted to give you an update. Uh, it's kind of a summary of where we've been and uh, how we're doing right now with the uh, COVID uh, management. And uh, I, I'd like to get a quick summary, you know, from our perspective of how things have transitioned. Uh, kind of started as we all started with this kind of storm warning uh, that came out of New York and Washington and made all the national news and we saw the crisis out there, but it was far away. And uh, we had a, uh, a California Hospital Association Emergency Operations Center alarm uh, go off. And in early March, uh, the CHA Executive Board uh, set an urgent alarm uh, requesting hospitals to develop a flex plan uh, to manage the, the surge, I call it a storm surge. But um, so in preparing for that, uh, they were asking us to be able to flex an additional 50% of our capacity, which is a lot to ask. Um, but we did uh, manage to uh, plan for space, <clears throat> excuse me, space that would be uh, moving our ICU uh, beds from eight up to 13. And if we needed to, all the way up to 32 beds. Uh, negative airspace, uh, which is what's essential for uh, contagious diseases, uh, tuberculosis being one of those, but this is certainly the most uh, voluminous uh, type of contagious disease that we've had. So we moved up from 29 beds all the way up to 67 beds uh, that were capable of uh, negative air, and they're still running today. Uh, we never did see this kind of uh, surge come out, but we were prepared in any case. 
uh, in the end, with tents and everything else that became available to us, <coughs> uh, we ended up with uh, a capability of up to 170 plus beds, uh, like I said, even with tents and whatnot. Um, we did also uh, identify some surgery space. Uh, currently, our GI lab is equipped with uh, negative air. So any kind of COVID patients that needed uh, surgery, uh, they went into a negative air surgical suite. And uh, we're actually now looking at uh, an architectural design uh, to create uh, another uh, surgical suite that would uh, be able to accommodate that. Lots of uh, rules and regulations to work through though. Uh, as most of you know, all of the elective surgeries got canceled right away and uh, the shelter in uh, dropped our revenues pretty dramatically, about 40% as the clinics uh, went to next to no patients. Emergency rooms, uh, about 60% initially uh, dropped off. Uh, surgeries was also 50 to 60 percent drop off as well as other outpatient services so it created quite a uh, cash crunch uh, and we did have to go through some uh, furloughs uh, but even with a 40 percent drop in our revenues we were only able to flex about 15 percent uh, we did create a plan for our employees to uh, uh, access the federal uh, unemployment supplement out there. So as I heard someone commenting earlier, uh, that was actually a good deal for maybe 40% of our uh, employees if they were able to take time off. So um, as far as a surge goes, uh, while they wanted us to prepare for a 50% increase, uh, what we saw in March uh, was only eight uh, patients come into the hospital. Uh, to be admitted. And then uh, in April, that jumped a little bit up to 21. And uh, we were always correlating it closest to uh, major holidays, I think Easter, Mother's Day. And as we progressed through the holidays, there was uh, also Memorial Day and Father's Day and then the 4th of July. So we watched in April jump to 21, but in May, suddenly it started to move forward. We had 69 uh, new admissions, uh, all of that fueled by holidays and family gatherings, we believe. Uh, on June, uh, we went from 69 up to 85 new cases, uh, and it just really grew to a, a, a dramatic situation where we were sending uh, two patients a day for critical care out of the valley because we couldn't manage it all. And that's just, that's just ours. That's not including, you probably double that, uh, what was going on in El Centro in uh, the way of transfers. Then in July, what we've seen is kind of a leveling. Uh, we don't have all the information in about it yet uh, as they continue to uh, document and chart uh, what the diagnoses were. But what I can tell you is that we only shipped out uh, two COVID patients uh, for the entire month of July. That's down from 76 in June. But what we did do is uh, at the beginning of July, we contracted for uh, about 20 critical care nurses on a temporary basis, as well as 10 uh, medical surgical nurses and four respiratory therapists. And then the state provided us with uh, two additional intensivists uh, to help Dr. Krusik and his uh, heroic battle out there. So all of that combined uh, enabled us to hold on to more critical care patients. Um, but now we're seeing uh, a change and it's only been two weeks of a change so far, but still that's more of a change than we've seen in the past several months. Uh, we were at our peak up in the high 40s uh, just for COVID patients and then uh, Right now, we're actually below 20 and staying uh, down that uh, range. And we've watched the seven day rolling average, which is kind of what the county and the state was using to uh, try to put some mathematical formulas to where this was headed. Uh, we've been below a 5% increase since July 14th. And the, it's actually been negative uh, since about July 16th. So we've been steadily dropping for uh, 
two plus weeks here. As far as the financial pressures go, uh, you drop 40% of your revenue, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult task to reorganize. Uh, we did eat up some cash, uh, and in the beginning, uh, March and April, uh, we finally got some relief, but it wasn't, it was about 24% of our revenues, which was very helpful, but it wasn't the 40%. Uh, and plus, they don't give you any warning about what you're going to receive or how you're going to receive it, and it just kind of shows up in your bank account, and later you learn how they calculated it. Um, the uh, May uh, was much better, and at that point, it was about 65% uh, of our revenues for the month. So at the end of May, we were feeling like we had actually caught up from the CARES Act funding. Uh, much to our surprise in June, a pleasant surprise, uh, we received more than a month's worth of revenue. And that really has set us in a pretty good uh, position at least for the next six to eight months. Keeping in mind that we still have only about 50% of our ER visits, 50% of our um, surgeries, uh, some things that really do contribute to our revenue. And over time, that's probably going to be eroded. Uh, the next measurement period is six months from now, and we don't expect to uh, see anything uh, until then, February, April timeframe, uh, February, March timeframe, so we're kind of holding our breath, but we're in a very good position right now, uh, as stronger, stronger on cash than we've been. Um, shortages, uh, I like to refer to it as uh, uh, you know, just insecurity on PPEs. We still kind of live week to week to find enough uh, protective equipment. Uh, we've had much more than we initially started with, uh, but we're still only receiving about 20% of what we request, and we still have to be careful about how we use it, that it's only for uh, the patients, primary, or the employees and doctors that are primarily in the uh, COVID patient rooms. So we're being very careful about that, uh, but it hasn't become a problem of uh, a stoppage or anything like that. Um, the testing, uh, certainly everybody knows we started with zero testing availability. Uh, we continue to see interruptions. Uh, we had uh, at our peak just a few weeks ago, uh, the National Guard had brought in uh, a group of, let me get that stupid thing done, sorry. Um, the National Guard had brought in uh, rapid testing equipment that doubled our capacity in-house, and we had just started the in-house capacity. It took that long to get orders filled. Uh, we were relying on the county turnaround. Uh, so just this week, uh, or last week, the National Guard uh, has moved on to Central California where they have some concerns about a hotspot there now. So we've lost half of that rapid turnaround uh, supply. And then uh, the county stopped supplying same-day services also as they begin to focus on institutional testing uh, especially like the prisons and, and the like. Um, we started off with enough ventilators to get by. Uh, the state, uh, I have to be complimentary of the Emergency Operations Center. They really helped us a great deal in the beginning and then again uh, in July when they've uh, almost doubled our capacity for ventilators. So uh, they've been a great help in that regard. We also, as I mentioned, uh, we've seen dramatic price increases, not only for PPEs, but we've also watched our cost of temporary help for nursing. Critical care, normally about $85 an hour, has jumped to $158 an hour. <clears throat> so you can imagine that that puts a crunch on, and that also will erode some of that uh, cash balance that we receive from the CARES Act. Um, let me see what else is out there. We are uh, still working on converting rooms. I mentioned the additional surgical suite. Uh, we did convert, uh, most of you know what it is, our crash site where the car drove into the side. That was an emergency room overflow. We did on an emergency basis get that uh, repurposed to house uh, patients under investigation who, are, who could be uh, COVID positive 
while we go through the test process. Uh, we, the, we did convert the ultrasound space for additional ICU beds, as I mentioned before, and we equipped the definitive observation area uh, to handle intensive care uh, patients also. Um, in the near term, the biggest concerns, like all of us are wondering, is this going up? Is it going down? Is this a temporary downturn? And how do you plan for that? Right now, we've set our sights on the next six months and planning that what we've seen in July will continue. <coughs> we'll be adjusting our, our uh, supply of registry people to accordingly. Uh, while we did dramatically decrease the number of transfers out there, um, we've really overstaffed uh, the two a day that we saw presenting uh, and transferring out in June uh, really was uh, minimal. Uh, we did see about a 50% increase in our ICU, but not two and three times. So uh, we'll be adjusting that in the immediate future. Um, let's see. Well, basically, we feel like we've, we've treaded through the surge and uh, we did get some uh, additional uh, medication treatments. The remdesivir uh, was provided by the state. Uh, and recently, I know that you've heard uh, Dr. Fareed talking about the uh, outpatient treatment he has with the, uh, uh, he calls it the cocktail, uh, the HCL out there. And he said he's seeing some good results with his patients. So uh, those have become more available, uh, but now it's, extremely expensive, somewhere around $3,200 per patient for a treatment regimen for inpatients. Um, I, I think that's generally uh, where we're at. Um, I'd at. We are at this point calling all of our uh, employees uh, back to work uh, to make sure that we're uh, getting prepared for the next six months. And uh, I would ask from here if you have any uh, comments, questions, concerns that I could help you with. Council, have any questions? Uh, Mr. Comments? Lewis, this is George Nava. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good, thanks, thanks for stopping by and informing the public and us on what's happening um, at the hospital. I appreciate that very, very much. Um, and thank you for sharing your comments uh, with respect to Dr. Farid. I know he's working on something that's getting some, right. some uh, publicity and that's, that's good. It's a local physician that's that's making uh, a difference here locally so i appreciate that you know he, he usually takes he's my doctor he usually t tells me to lay off the cocktails but i think that's a different <laughs> that's a different uh, item that he's talking about so but no i certainly appreciate the information that you're sharing with the public and um just like the hospital the city i mean we're having a, a hard time you know we plan a year and ahead and, and even further you know five years and ten years ahead but it's really <laughs> difficult to see what's gonna happen in 90 days and 120 days and, and six months. It's really difficult to predict that. And uh, your business is more day to day, right? So those, those revenues that aren't coming in are having a greater impact on you. Ours are a little bit different, but um, certainly anything that we can help with in, in whatever respect, <laughs> whether that's messaging, um, we do have uh, the opportunity to message our our residents here in the city of Raleigh through billing and through through the billing notices and uh, through you know text uh, digital medium so and then of course the hub so if there's anything that we can assist with um, I'm sure the council and so forth we'd be happy to be able to assist and again I just want to thank you for um, for your leadership and for the work that you and your staff are doing thank you absolutely I, I would like to say thank you to the entire community too and anybody that's listening there's been uh, 40, 50 different organizations and individuals that have uh, donated, uh, whether it's uh, PPE or food for those that can't uh, get a break and get away. Uh, it's been much appreciated. <laughs> and I hope that if you haven't seen yet, you will soon. Uh, a great big thank you in the, the media and on our website. Uh, just naming individuals that have contributed and the variety of different things that were contributed. But, Many thanks to all of you for supporting us. You know, and that, and that hole in the building, had you known you could have used it for like drive-through testing, you know what I mean? You could have just <laughs> left it there. 
<laughs> yeah, the first trial run. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments, um, uh, Councilman Couchman or Mayor Pertem Hamby? Yeah, I, I did want to ask you, Larry, if you could reiterate, you, you said something about um, the, the rates, the positivity rates, uh, the last two weeks have been, did you say negative? Uh, yeah. Like they've, they've gone down that much? Absolutely. Um, it's been negative since about July 16th, I believe I said. And uh, if I can pull it up real quick, uh, the rolling seven day average started, um, well, it looks like it was more like the 22nd. There was some negatives about the 16th and whatnot, but uh, it's been steadily declining to where it was on a daily basis. That rolling seven day went from 1.7 negative to 2.1, 3.1. Uh, even today, it's down to 6.1 drop. There's been a lot of 5% and 4% drops here in the last week. So, uh, like I mentioned, if we were in our peak, we were hitting in the 49 range and even averaging in uh, the 40s. Right now, uh, today, we have 18. And for the last several days, it's been uh, 20, 21, uh, that sort of thing. So, it's still busy, but it's not insane busy right now. So along those lines, I, this is probably more something that the, uh, the county health would need to answer. But as we see the numbers on the dashboard, um, those are obviously, there's delays in getting those numbers. Um, so we're seeing numbers that, that may be days or a week old. Um, the, the positivity rate and the death rate um, would you be able to speak to um, over the last week or two, how those numbers are looking compared to the dashboard? I would actually have to look at those. Uh, I haven't compared those. Um, when I see the, the numbers that are total for the county, there's a great deal of those uh, mortalities that occur outside of a hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just a fraction of it, so. Okay. Yeah, there were a few days where it was like, you know, 10, 10 deaths a day that were being added to the number. So it was yeah. discouraging, although the positivity rate seemed to be declining pretty rapidly. Yeah. And when I talk about the seven day rolling average, that's what they use for hospitals for an inpatient census. How does it okay. change uh, from uh, day to day? So it, it's the combined total for the county, but it's only about the inpatient census. So that's the most critical people. Okay. Thank you for for uh, your update. Absolutely, you're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. I appreciate uh, your coming in and giving us this update. I think everybody out there is always wondering what's happening because they just see uh, all the data that's for the whole county and yeah. they're wondering what's happening in our hospital at Pioneers Memorial. So this is a great opportunity for you to share with everybody in the community. And I think you've brought us a lot of good news actually uh, because the money came in with the CARES Act, which is all great, and you're able to, uh, we'll be bringing back your staff to work. And, uh, you know, some of those uh, that were sent from state or federal can go back and assist other areas now Absolutely. that are, are in bigger need, you know, because I think the governor did use us as, the, as an example, as the imperial, what did he call it, Rosanna? Imperial system? Plan, or? system or plan or something. The imperial model was in yes. Governor. He called it the imperial model on, on his uh, on yesterday's uh, uh, presentation that he did in his conference. Wow. So um, yeah, so they're looking at at all the help that was provided to Imperial County, and I know we appreciate it, and I know that your hospital appreciates it. So thank you so much for your report, and uh, we we hope that the numbers continue to go in the right direction. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on then to uh, item number 5A2, uh, um, overall outlook presented by our fire chief, Mike York. Is Mike? Yes, we are in the process of adding him to the okay. screen. Hello, fire chief Mike. How are you? Welcome. Good. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council and city staff, as my audio. Yes. Yes, we can hear you, good. 
Good evening. I want to say thank you also to Mr. Larry Lewis for providing that update to our local hospital and, and more uh, based in our community. Um, just going to provide a supplemental update um, as I have been on our community as a whole in the Valley. I'm going to start with our uh, case counts as provided by the Imperial County Department of Public Health. Uh, to date, we in the Valley have tested a total of 48,793 persons for COVID, which is really amazing. It shows our testing capabilities are up there. They're meeting what the state is asking for. Uh, we have a total negative of 38,911, uh, which is excellent news. And those numbers have been trending down, as Mr. Lewis has said. Um, our total positive case counter valley is now at 9,513. And I think it's very important to note uh, for the community that the most affected age group for positive cases are 20 to 29 year olds, probably reflective of uh, the people that are in the workforce um, and the people that tend to uh, gather a little bit more um, in social settings. Uh, we currently have 873 active cases in our hospital, 47, I'm sorry, 873 active cases in our valley, excuse me, 47 are currently hospitalized, which shows that the majority are being treated at home, which is good news. Generally, that means they're lower acuity. Um, our current surge capacity is zero, so we're utilizing zero of our surge as reported today. Um, the alternative care site out at IBC is a third facility uh, aside from our hospitals. There are nine people currently uh, at that facility um, and it has treated a, a total of 203 patients uh, from its opening to this date. Um, we have had 8,408 persons recover from COVID-19 in our community, which is all uh, very excellent news and congratulations to all people on recoveries and their family. Unfortunately, in our community, we've, uh, we've recorded 232 deaths and our condolences definitely go out to all of those. Uh, I know that we've had many in our community and close to us have been affected by these deaths. Uh, previously, the 70 to 79 age group was the big target for uh, the mortalities, uh, but what we're seeing now is that it has spread out the age group all the way from 60 up to 89. Um, Chief, Chief York, this is George. You might yes, have asked a question. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No um, problem. And, and maybe you know the information, maybe you don't, but with respect to the, to the, the, the people who have passed away from COVID in the New York <coughs> County. Is there a number um, for like Raleigh residents? Do you, would you happen to know that? Yes, sir. Um, within the, well, the 92227 zip code. So right, Raleigh, right. and that's expensive, right? Uh -huh. Outlying area. We've had 28 deaths in our, in our zip code. Uh, 1,613 positive cases and 28 deaths. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, as, as always, we are tied very close to our neighbors, both uh, interstate and internationally. Yuma County, has, uh, their testing numbers are, are similar to ours. They've tested 54,000, uh, about 11,000 confirmed, and unfortunately, they've had 270 deaths. Uh, the numbers provided in the EOC briefing by a representative out of Mexicali um, are dated August 2nd. Mexicali is recording 7,246 positive, 1,252 deaths. Um, as Mr. Lewis was talking about, one of the big metrics for the state is the seven-day average. So throughout of our county, the uh, goal is to have a, a ratio of tested to positive patients be less than 8%. My last update to the city council, we were at 17.68. As of today, our seven-day average is 12.5%. So a pretty marked decrease. Uh, we are trending downward and we're, we're very hopeful that that will continue. Um, as we haven't had any, uh, we're, we're outside of the windows of the major holidays, major gathering kind of functions. Hopefully we'll see these continue downward. Um, within the city of Brawley since March, the fire department has responded to 120 calls for COVID related um, issues. Uh, 52 of which were COVID positive confirmed. Um, 
we have reached a status of sustainability with our morgue and mortuary services. That was uh, reported at the last update that there, that was recently fixed and we had some concerns there. Um, our skilled nursing facilities, retirement homes, et cetera, have uh, also been the recipient of a lot of help from the state. Uh, within our city, we are still continuing to perform our functions. We are working on plans and contingencies um, with the changing guidelines and changing numbers, just trying to stay ahead of it. If there are any other questions, I would uh, do my best to answer at this time. Um, Chief, there was an article, and it might have been uh, based on maybe a few weeks ago, but the activity at the morgue, at the morgue, is that already under control, did you say? Yes, ma'am. Um, a few weeks ago, we were contacted by the uh, mortuary operating in the city of Brawley that they were at capacity and needed assistance. Um, a hazardous materials response team that's comprised of members of, of agencies throughout the, the county responded to assist them with uh, setting up storage racks and moving and arranging the decedents. Uh, since that time, uh, the Imperial County Sheriff's Office uh, and um, Fry have been the recipients of portable storage units and additional supplies to assist them. And our latest report is that they they have reached sustainability at this time. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Okay, any questions for our chief? Okay, I guess uh, unless you have anything else, that uh, thank you so much for the report. Very comprehensive and very good news because I, I think we're all aiming towards that eight, eight, under 8% eight uh, positivity rate. So it's going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. You're very welcome. Um, if there's nothing further, I think we can move. Are you on the next one also? Yes, ma'am. On the next item, okay. Um, Okay, we'll go ahead and move on then to uh, discussion and potential action to extend the local emergency by 60 days. The backup is on pages 46 through 48. And Chief, you can go ahead and cover that, please. Um, so in front of you is a resolution to extend the, on, the proclamation of an ongoing emergency. Uh, this is something by policy that is in front of the council every 60 days until the emergency um, is ceased. Um, our last update was on June 16th proclamation and before you is the extension. I'll make a motion to continue that. That's just an update though. That's just a, we don't even need a motion, do we on that? We I think we do. Motion for the resolution. Yeah, okay. go ahead. So we do. All right. Okay. Well, uh, let me go ahead. Okay. To approve George. The uh, who's second? Did anyone I will. Second? This okay. is Sam. Okay. Uh, okay. Motion by George, second by uh, Sam. And let me just, just read the, the header on the resolution of the City Council of the City of Brawley proclaiming the existence of an ongoing local emergency for COVID-19. So this extends um, the period for another 90 days. Is that correct? It, it's an additional 60 days, which is <laughs> on mom allowed by state law. And this extends it for an additional 60 days. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. You're very welcome. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on uh, to item 5, 5B. Discussion and potential action to approve resolution number 2020, resolution of City Council of City of Brawley, amending fiscal year 2020 to 2021 City of Brawley budget for the fire department in the amount of $78,630.69 to address the repair of the ladder truck. And the backup materials on pages 49 through 52. And again, I guess fire chief Mike will be uh, covering that for us. M Madam Mayor, for the sake of time, um, this is George. 
Uh, I have read the backup material. I would like to make a motion to approve the item. Okay, motion by Councilman Nava. This is Sam Couchman, I'll second. Okay, motion by Nava, seconded by Councilman Couchman. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Okay, very good. That's a big expense, but I guess we needed to spend that money, right? Yes, <laughs> we need the fire truck. Yes. Okay, then moving on to item 5C, discussion and potential action to authorize phase two payment in the amount of $494,736 to the Imperial Irrigation District for the undergrounding of the Best Canal from South First Street to South Imperial Avenue, Dogwood Road. And the back, backup material is on pages 53 through 57. Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the Council, Guillermo Sillas, Public Works Director. This item mm -hmm. is, um, as uh, described, is for the second phase of the uh, IID Best Canal Undergrounding that uh, has a contribution of 75% uh, from IID, and the city is responsible to pay the 25% remaining of the construction cost and 100% of the uh, other uh, expenditures that are not uh, directly related or covered by the, this program. <clears throat> um, it, it is included on the material, the math of uh, the initial cost, the design, the construction, and the initial deposit that we provided in the amount of $70,000 for this second phase. And the remaining that we have to deposit for them to proceed with the construction it is $494,736, which is reimbursable from um, the development Larigo Ranch subdivision. Questions that you have uh, related to this item? I think the backup uh, indicates, Guillermo, that, that they will be reimbursing that full amount to us to uh, the developer. Is that correct? to the city. The developer should uh, reimburse to the city uh, for this amount, uh, the 25% of the cost and 100% of the additional uh, cost for uh, uh, utilities uh, relocation. Okay. Uh, Mayor Kessner, how do you, if I may, uh, yes. one item. Um, you'll find on page 55 uh, a quick recap of the timing um, so in order for phase two undergrounding work to begin, um, you might recall there are lots of different considerations for this particular canal being taken out of service and minimizing negative impacts to our agriculture uh, community. So uh, what we're hoping for is to get the approval tonight to allow for that phase two construction uh, to begin as rapidly as possible. And uh, the Imperial Irrigation District has indicated that uh, with Tonight's action, uh, an item will be prepared for the board's consideration so that uh, that action item will be before them on the 18th of August. So uh, this project continues to move along and uh, Wildcat continues to be a priority for the city and uh, the surrounding area. Okay. Additional information is that um, <clears throat> we have been having uh, meetings, coordination meetings with uh, the IID water and energy with the uh, so-called gas company, um, AT&T and uh, Spectrum, the cable company, because there's all these utilities are on the way of this uh, pipe. And there's a significant effort from these utility companies to relocate their facilities and so we are in this close communication and the IID has expressed, as the city manager mentioned, that the window that they have to do this project this year is in October. So in order for that to happen, so we need to, you know, um, complete all these milestones to be relocating the utilities and be able to start construction for the water outage in October. Okay, thank you for that explanation. I'm looking for a motion. I'll make the motion. This is Sam Couchman. I'm looking forward to having that go through. This is George. I'll second the motion. Okay. Motion by Councilmember Couchman and seconded by Councilmember Nava. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. You can communicate that to IID like ASAP. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to item 5D, discussion and potential action to authorize contract change order number one to contract number 2019-03 with Gerlich Mitchell Incorporated for the Brawley Water Treatment Plant sedimentation basement improvement project in the amount of $38,214.07. And the backup is on pages 58 through 61. Guillermo? Yes, uh, during the course of this project, uh, you might recall uh, during this emergency project that uh, some time ago I mentioned that I might come back to you as a council to um, approve or, or um, uh, received a request to do this change order for the replacement of uh, the actuator of, of a bulb that it is um, working to be able to remove the sludge from the sedimentation <coughs> base, which is in under construction very close to finish I will provide a report later on and so we, we thought uh, that was uh, in our advantage to include in this project that we have a contract open, the replacement of this actuator and not to have a separate project later on. Um, similarly, we have uh, another item that has been uh, in the budget, which is the replacement of a BFD for one of the, the last pumps, the raw water pumps that are in charge to move the water from the raw uh, pond to the sedimentation basin. We have uh, four pumps there, uh, currently three working with DFD, which is in charge to uh, operate the pumps slowly and uh, avoid uh, the water hammer to the system that can cause a, a, a break. So we thought that was a good idea to include it since we have this contract, we have the contractor, so we can um, take advantage of that and do those replacements instead of a separate project. So that's the reason for the change order. Okay, thank you very much for all that information, Guillermo. Anyone uh, looking for a motion? This is Luke, I'll move to approve that expenditure. Okay. George with a second. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Hamby, seconded by Councilman Nava. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Guillermo. Thank you. Okay, moving on. I think you're still on, Guillermo. Um, moving on to item 5E, discussion and potential action to approve the development agreement and bonds for Ocotillo Springs Apartments and resolution number 2020. Resolution of the City of Raleigh, California to accept the development agreement and bonds for the construction of the Alcotillo Springs Apartments project. And your backup materials on pages 62 to 73. Yes, this development is proposed uh, at the intersection of I Street and 18th Street. 18th Street, which is not constructed yet, but is part of this development. Uh, we have been reviewing a very quick and in expedited um, way the improvement plans because the constraint of uh, the financial documents that the developer has and we have received bonds and uh, some other documents and prepared the development agreement so everything is ready and lined up to move forward we just need uh, your approval uh, for this project is part of a very large application uh, a couple of years ago and, um, Any questions that you have? Uh, any questions from council? Uh, Rosanna? Uh, Mayor and council would just want to know this is the project that's the subject of the strategic growth council award of approximately 12 million dollars uh, we really um, depended on a number of different departments to get this ready tonight and want to thank our city attorney as well for really rapid uh, expedited review. The milestones uh, really put some pressure on our review system to, to get it ready for tonight in advance of the state's deadline for the nonprofit developer. So I um, want to thank our staff for, 
for uh, the the extra effort on this project. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve. Second, to Sam. Okay. Motion by myself and seconded by Councilman Couchman. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any uh, abstentions or uh, opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. We're lo really looking forward to that project uh, moving forward also. That's a big project that thank we you. wanna see come to fruition. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item 5F, discussion and potential action to approve resolution 2020 resolution of City Council of City of Brawley authorizing the engagement of Tyler Technologies in the amount of 209,366 for the first year implementation fees of an enterprise resource planning software solution. And all the backup material is very lengthy. I hope you all have time to read it. Pages 74 through 172. And Mr. Tyler Salcido, our finance director, will give us a, a brief summary of what he's bringing to us tonight. You're on, Tyler. Good, good evening, Madam Mayor and fellow council members. Uh, before you and for your consideration today are the resolution and agreement for the new ERP solution from uh, Tyler Technologies. The name of the solution itself is ENCODE. Uh, currently, the city is utilizing fund balance, which is also uh, uh, under the Tyler Tech umbrella. Uh, Fund balance has all our general ledger accounts payable, utility billing and payroll applications. Um, some of the limitations of the current system are, for one, fine, uh, fund balance was designed for use by agencies smaller than the city of Barali. And uh, the finance is the only department with direct access to any financial information and data. Other departments cannot access needed information in real time and must rely on our finance staff for their information needs. Uh, due to the limitations of fund balance, most of the city's processes and workflows are very manual, time consuming and inefficient. Uh, they produce massive amounts of paper and documents that need storing. Some examples uh, quickly would be uh, AP, manual check, uh, paper check requests are produced and copied and sent over to finance for processing. Uh, payroll, all employees temporary, full-time, every single employee manually fills out paper timesheets, reviewed by the supervisor, signed off, and then reviewed by department heads. After approval, finance must manually enter each individual's time into the payroll application. Also, the current payroll system uh, for us to uh, cor uh, correct rates of special pay types must be manual, manually calculated for each pay period. Uh, another limitation is human resources and payroll are not interfaced, producing a lot of back and forth uh, between the two departments, as well as building permits and bins, business licensing not interfacing with finance currently. ENCODE addresses uh, these and other inefficiencies and will moder modernize the city's workflow and processes. Uh, some examples are all departments will have access to the ERP with information provided in real time customized dashboards, dashboards for each department, including city council. Uh, electronic timekeeping, accurately capturing all hours worked. Electronic AP processes with proper approval ch uh, channels electronically processed and recorded. And the ability to provide utility customers with uh, more statement delivery options, for example, uh, emailed copies of statements and also will pro provide the ability for customers to review their usage electronically, uh, not having to call the city and question uh, how much it is, what have you, et cetera. Streamlining business and construction permitting processes and a robust, a robust remote work option capability. Uh, those are just some of the benefits. So last year, the finance and IT departments requested quotes and software demonstrations. Uh, the city received three responses ranging in price from about $140,000 to $516,000 for first year implementation alone, um, not including ongoing costs for years two through five down the line. Um, based on cost considerations, software demonstrations, staff input, 
and reviews from other California local agencies, Armando and myself um, have selected ENCODE from Tyler Tech for the city's future ERP solution. First, the first year costs are estimated at 209,366. These amounts are included in the adopted budget for fiscal year 2021 already. Of that $209,000 allocated to the general fund will be about $80,600 with the remaining $121,000 to the rest of the enterprise and special fund. The ongoing uh, uh, cost for the software years two through five will be about $79,706 with the general fund portion uh, being about $33,700 and the remainder $45,000, $46,000 for the enterprise and special funds. Uh, years two through five. Rollout's estimated to take about uh, 12 to 18 years, which includes the whole implementation, data conversion, and the uh, rollout of going live. Uh, we anticipate going live sometime in fiscal year 21-22. The rollout scope of work is uh, uh, detailed in that attached agreement that the mayor referenced. Uh, there's 60 pages of phone and laying out the whole plan that we will get us from uh, from the beginning to, to going live. Are there any questions that I can clarify or answer? Just for clarification, you said the rollout was 12 to 18 months. Is that what you okay. estimated? Yes. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, said you, yeah, said you, said, you said years. You said years. You said years. I want, oh, I want to promise it, that you're going to be Sorry, 12 to 18 years. months. It's going to feel like 18 years, but yeah. <laughs> it's going to. I'll tell you, you what, want, though. I just wanted technology? to make sure that, that it was in months and not years. My no, that, that's the home of guarantee. That's what yeah. I want. That, that, that's the time frame that's expected, I think, for this type of program. You know, we, we really operate. I don't know if the public knows this. I don't even know if everybody on staff or even council knows. But the systems we use currently are, I mean, in technology terms, are prehistoric. They, they are, you know, 30, 35-year-old systems that we're using. You know, even the manual system is even older than that. But it just it's we're way behind the time and it's just i know it's an expensive initial um uh, initially but i can just see the efficiency the effectiveness of everything moving forward i think everybody's as time goes on you're used to seeing and having access to information from the consumer perspective and from staff i mean we need to be able to access information whenever we've had recently whenever we've had trouble in calculating uh information and calculating information with respect to employee wages and things of that nature, that is, uh, it's been a long process and it's very manual. And so I think this is going to save us quite a bit of time. It's going to be very effective and efficient. And then not to mention like the billing and everything else that we're doing, that's still a, such a manual process. And I don't know if everybody knows that, but that's taking so much time just to get through, you know, the billing cycles every month. So I'm glad to see it. Uh, finally coming um, together and, and uh, this is one s really large step for the city so thanks for um, and thank Mondo as well yes, um, Tyler for for working through this because I know it took a lot of uh, time and energy to sort through the vendors and then seeing how we can implement it within our city with our current technology and all those sort of things so thank you thank you any other comments from council Tyler is there going to be a crossover period of time where where you're working with two different systems? Yes, yes. Uh, I anticipate about three to four months of uh, testing the new system while we're continuing to work with the old system to make sure everything is, is, uh, is uh, working properly. Uh, we've, we've tried to eliminate all errors or, or issues that may arise before actually going live 100%. But it, it, I, I anticipate, anticipate probably about three to four months for that, not years, months. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for all your hard work on that. Full implementation in 44 Thank years. You. 44 <laughs> years. <laughs> in 18 months. And so, okay, we have in, in all this paper on page 74, if I'm right, on page 74, we have the actual, uh, is that right? No? The resolution. I have it listed okay. as 75. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. With the reso on 77. 77, okay. Right. Uh, resolution of the City Council of City of Brawley authorizing the engagement of Tyler Technologies in the amount of 209366 
for the first year implementation fees of an enterprise resource planning software solution. Looking for a motion. This is Luke. I will, I will gladly make a motion to approve that resolution. This is George. I'll second the motion. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem Hamby, second by Councilman Nava. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? None. The motion carries. Congratulations, Tyler and Armando and everybody else that's helped you with the, making this happen. I think it's, it's long overdue for sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on to item 5G, uh, discussion and potential uh, staff direction re Graffiti abatement needs is uh, Rosanna. Yes, I have a brief summary for the council and then I'm hoping to receive some staff direction. Um, as uh, council may recall, uh, we have in prior years staffed graffiti abatement um, in various formats, uh, including most recently in a 20 um, hour per week format uh, of a temporary employee. Um, since that position uh, was uh, temporarily suspended uh, with COVID and a number of temporary positions being, uh, being laid off uh, to preserve cash uh, from the general fund um, as we faced the uncertainty of COVID, uh, between that time and now, the city has begun to experience some pretty significant graffiti. And if it hasn't caught your attention yet, you might see it um, along a couple of stretches in particular from uh, the, uh, on some of our alleys off of Main Street, just beyond the plaza, pretty extensive um, graffiti is making its way uh, along the rear of buildings that face Main Street. And also we, we have quite a bit of activity that has uh, stretched along uh, uh, the east boundary of Hinojosa Park, all the way down to Malin, uh, uh, to Kay and Malin. And so you can see kind of um, the in pretty incredible effort that, that used to be regularly undertaken as a courtesy service that we offer to private property owners. When we don't have um, the graffiti abatement resource in play uh, in-house, what we do is basically resort to a letter writing campaign when it's not our own city property. Uh, instead, uh, what we do is make the homeowner aware or property owner aware that there has uh, been graffiti on their property and that city ordinance uh, uh, language requires its abatement. As you can imagine, it can take quite a bit of time uh, to accomplish that much, much longer than um, sometimes deploying uh, our own resources. So um, this topic has bubbled uh, with uh, at least one council member, and I imagine all of you have noticed uh, the, the change in the landscape. Uh, we have been able to very rapidly address our, some of our best shelters that have been hit, as well as uh, the handball court at Hinojosa Park was pretty significantly um, uh, defaced um, a number of weekends ago. And so what we do on the city properties is basically work with either parks and rec personnel or uh, pub, uh, public works employees to uh, as quickly as we can integrate that, that work into uh, the regular work day. So having said that, um, th this item was placed on the agenda to kind of pose the question of whether uh, the council would like to see some resources uh, pulled from the general fund reserve to address some of these needs on an, uh, a near-term basis. Um, last year, just as a point of reference, uh, the city had budgeted approximately $26,000 for that 20 hour um, a week uh, format. And in the prior year, we had budgeted approximately $40,000. So um, what we could do is um, seek to bring back um, an individual who can help with abatement and simply work the known impacted areas or do something more consistently. Uh, the reason it wasn't incorporated into the budget as presented was really you know, the struggle that we, we continue to have in matching our, 
ongoing revenues with ongoing expenditures. So wanted to bring that, that item to the council for consideration and see where you would like it to go. Ma Madam Mayor, this is George. If I could make a comment, please. Yes, please go ahead. So everyone, just for the sake of clarity, I did bring this item up recently to Rosanna and I'm not sure if anybody else did, but I have noticed uh, a tremendous amount of graffiti that's taking place throughout the city. And so I brought those items up to her. And my, my fear is that if we allow it to continue, um, I know we can address it with the property owners, but we know that that takes a tremendous amount of time. And, uh, you know, I feel like we need to address it sooner than later, even on a very temporary basis, but just to maybe address some, some um, areas of activity that are really making things look terrible. So um, I just wanted to make it clear that I, I'm, I brought this item up. I hope uh, there is some support, even if it's on a temporary basis, just to get um, some of those items covered up. And so they don't, uh, you know, create further problems for us because, you know, I, I see it spreading. It's starting in one area and when that's not being removed, it's going, it's continuing. And I've seen that very recently. So, um, those are the comments I wanted to share with everybody. So if you can give it some consideration for um, maybe some limited funding so we can move forward, I'd appreciate it. I think um, the residents would as well. Ms. Uh, Madam Mayor. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. Um, I think we have a history of this, we've seen it. I think we implemented the graffiti abatement program to try to alleviate some of these concerns. I believe that they've done studies that the sooner you can get to the graffiti, the more likely you are not to have a repeat or at least to stop the frequency of graffiti occurring. So I'm in favor of doing something, at least temporarily, uh, as George mentioned, uh, to try to uh, at least knock some of this down in areas that it seems to be uh, traveling to, because eventually it'll be all over the city. And, and I think we've got to do something. I think we had a pretty good program in place uh, due to budget considerations. Certainly some of those things have to be looked at, but I think temporarily we have to address this. And I don't think the staff has the time or the people available to address that on a daily basis. So I, I'm in favor of us taking some form of action, even if it's limited. Um, would the council be open to a future uh, budget adjustment action item coming to the next meeting that is of a particular dollar value and then we can work within that dollar value to uh, match the resource with the need? And we can move it forward at this point, just with the, the concurrence of the council this evening. I, I, would be in favor, I would be in favor of doing that. I think the aesthetics of our city are very, very important. And if we let it go, it's just gonna get worse. I had already noticed some graffiti. I didn't know how extensive it was, but yeah, we need to uh, try to address it. The sooner the better. So if you wanna do a budget um, adjustment for our next meeting, that, that would work. That's fine, us. that'll work. Uh, would you like to express um, as a body what that value would be? Is it 5,000? Is it 10,000? I would think like a, a, a half-time position. I don't know what the cost would be for that, but uh, 20 hours 20, a week. You did 26 <laughs> last year for a whole year, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Is that a half-time position? Yes. I would be in favor of a half-time position. I don't know if anybody else has any... any uh, desire to do more or less i don't know luke do you have any comments or any um any opinion on the matter well i know that it was it was a very tough decision for all of us to eliminate the graffiti abatement officer from from the budget to begin with because we knew i think we all knew this would become an issue right. and and the person that was fulfilling that position did a great job and was quick and was good at mixing colors and all that kind of stuff and um, I think the idea of having, you know, different public works or parks and rec employees trying to pick up the slack in this position throughout the day is, is probably not feasible just because the, 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 uh, the skill set required is a little different than what, what most of them are doing. And, um, and again, I think it, the rapid response of a graffiti abatement officer is, is something that, you know, as as the mayor mentioned you know it takes care of the problem quickly um and and i think reduces some of the spread but um you know we're, we're stuck in this position of trying to come up with money or or understanding that we're going to decrease our our reserves um even more so when we're up against a decision of 
of how to uh, to bring those reserves back up to a level that that puts us in a better position as far as our bond rating and all that kind of stuff goes. Um, but if we're trying to assign a dollar amount, obviously it has to be something that that makes it worthwhile. If if we're talking about bringing the same person back on um, to do the graffiti abatement, is that Rosanna? Is that what you have in mind? Or um, we have made contact with our prior uh, employee. Um, I, I would be happy to talk on offline with you about the particulars, but the okay. short of it is uh, he is available for extra help, but a full-time uh, type of schedule is, is not likely to be a fit with other activities that he has going on. So okay. what we would do is work with him and ensure that the proper supervision is in play for hours outside of existing work hours that he currently gotcha. performs for another place. Well, well yeah. maybe, maybe that's just what we need right now. Yeah. So it fits what, you know, we're able to do and it maybe it fits what he's able to do. So, right. yeah. Yeah. I was concerned it wasn't going to be worth his while to come yeah, back on maybe, for a few hours a week or something. But maybe I'd it be is, happy so. to discuss it with you um, at, at greater, in greater detail. Okay. As appropriate, but. Um, do you need a, a dollar figure? For you want a dollar figure? Mm -hmm. be, I mean, I, we, so we, we could leave it open for you. What, what was in place before, and if it's not used, it's not used. Maybe that's a an approach we can take. Yeah, Maybe if he's not available for the twenty hours, uh, and the amount was twenty six thousand, you said a it's year a change, right. right? So if that is your wish, we will prepare that item for council action for your next meeting. Let's do yeah, that. That's, that's, that's my wish. Is everyone open to that? Yeah, I'm, yes. I'm in favor of that. I'm as well. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Mayor um, Kastner, how to be, if I may uh, make a quick note to the council, uh, our city clerk has indicated to me at a few minutes after six, we actually did have, do have and continue to have uh, council member Donnie Wharton uh, participating off camera. So he oh, okay. has, uh, been yes. actually an active <laughs> part of this meeting. He's not able uh, to report on screen but he uh, is corresponding with me offline that he is present and uh, participating in this meeting. All right, very good. Thank you. Donnie, take hey, care Donnie. of yourself. Hope you're doing well. Hi, Donnie. Hello, hello. You, have you should have interrupted us and we could have just, you know, acknowledged you all along. <laughs> I've just been saying I. Okay. <laughs> I, I hope you're gonna have a fish fry when you come home because we're looking forward to that. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Okay, that's that's great. I'm glad that Donnie was able to join us. Um, okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to item six, depart departmental reports. And the first one is the uh, 6A update on the emergency construction project at the Brawley Water Treatment Plant to replace uh, components of two sedimentation basins presented by uh, Public Works Director Guillermo Sias. Is he still with us? Guillermo is with us, and I'll add him real quick to... Apologies. Here we go. There you are. Okay, Guillermo. Right. Um, okay. The status of this project is the basin number one, the last part uh, that we call the trough, which are the channels for discharge of the water, were installed last Friday, and they are working, and they will be tested for a week. Uh, the basin number two, all items have been completed on this basin and the trough stopped leaking and are working properly. So we will test um, the, this, this piece of equipment for a week uh, for the regular contract and later on we will have to wait for the arrival of the actuator uh, and the BFD for the change order that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Okay. But we're hoping that uh, the original project will be completed uh, within a week, maximum two weeks. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions thank for you. council? Nope. Okay, thank you, Guillermo. Thank you. Uh, next report is our monthly staffing report for August, prepared by our personnel and risk management administrator, Shirley Bonillas, and it's on page 173. Good evening. Welcome, Ms. Bonillas. How are you this, this evening? Council Member Shirley Bonillas, Personnel and Risk Management. As you can see by the report that we're still in recruitment process. 
Uh, we have the fire department openings as well as police officer and still looking for a dispatcher. We do have a police officer and one dispatcher in backgrounds and we're tentatively scheduled for uh, late next week for police officer interviews. So we continue to recruit for those positions. And we currently have open two general labor positions. We're not getting the application volume that we normally do at this time. Um, hearing the council's earlier comments, it probably because people are currently receiving uh, the last of the federal dollars as well as the unemployment dollars. Um, so I yeah. opened those positions. We're seeking three positions in each public works and in parks to assist with uh, the right of ways and the general maintenance of the city. Of course, I'll answer any questions I'm able to. Okay, any questions for Ms. Bonillas? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, city treasurer report. Do we have um, Tyler? There he is. Hi, Tyler. Hello again, Tyler. Hello. Um, the 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 investment reports in your uh, packet have been reviewed by the city treasurer, uh, Mr. Smirden. So uh, he has graciously allowed me to go ahead and report on them. Um, okay. I'm gonna, um, I'm going to share my screen uh, with a, a few slide decks, uh, slides. I, I promise to be quick. Uh, yes, but, uh, and we'll just review them real quick. Let's see if I can do this. Is this going to take 18 years, Tyler? Or? Uh, um, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe <laughs> months. <two> years. <laughs> 18 months from. Okay. Are we up? We yes. Yeah, we are. Okay. We so, can see uh, in, in your packet are the details for the investment report for uh, quarter ending March 30 and June 30, 2020, that lists each investment that the city owns. Here on this first screen here is a summary just broken down by the types of uh, instruments. Um, as you might note out on this uh, first slide here, the total portfolio is about $51.8 million with about 65% of that being in cash. Uh, two new in investment instruments, the California state obligations and medium term notes. The medium term no notes are uh, corporate bond type instruments. Those are definitely allowable investment uh, instruments uh, for the state government code that we reviewed in prior meetings. Uh, we are uh, expanding our horizon per se to try to capture as, as much of the interest rates out there, uh, strong interest rates that we can, as, as everybody is aware, uh, interest rates have been declining uh, rapidly. Uh, as of 630, the average yield for LAIF uh, has been, was about 1.41%. Our local CDs with our local banks here, uh, their weighted averages are about one9 uh, four percent as of 6:30, and the MBS securities, as a whole, are returning 2.22 percent as of 6:30. Uh, Late today was 0.084, so the uh, rates are continuing to uh, to drop here. Um, the next slides are uh, just the activity of by month of what was bought and sold. Uh, from January through June 20. Uh, you'll notice that the activity is much higher than prior months, and that's due to the declining rates that I spoke of and, and causing uh, the, a lot of the institutions to call the callable securities that we had. Uh, when, when, right, when, wait, uh, excuse me, when rates drop, uh, institutions love to call them back in and, and, they, and they can uh, not have to pay the higher, higher than market rates. Also think a notable item on this January, uh, for January 2020, uh, the locking down of a 12 month CD with Sun Community at 2.02 for the next 12 months. That's pretty good. Uh, February activity, you notice the CD was called and reinvested at 1.75. For March, we had numerous uh, multiple investments called 
and reinvested. The average current yield uh, on here the, of these purchases is about 1.1%. Uh, these were the CDs, the negotiable CDs and the MBS that were sold, redeemed, and they had averaged about 2.07 yields on those. For uh, April, beginning here in April, the city's first of the two U.S. agency obligations that the city owned were called uh, as well. This first one here for uh, the Federal National Mortgage Association for 490 was, was called. And in May is where we uh, purchased those obligations, the instruments that I re referred to earlier, the California State Obligation Bonds, and the Barclays Bank medium term note, which is uh, paying about 2% to yield out to maturity, which is is, is good at, uh, for this time of year. Uh, rates are now, sorry. Okay, and then in, also in May, the, the second of the two US agency obligations sold in May, about a billion dollars. For June, uh, the activity in June reflects the maturing and rollover of a 12-month CD held at uh, CVB locally. Uh, it was earning 2.2, but now uh, it is rolled over to about 0.75 for the next 12 months. And finally, this last slide here shows the maturity uh, just, uh, timeline of our MBS securities when they mature from uh, 2020 through 2025. I ran through that pretty quickly. Are there any questions? None for me. Thank you so much for your comprehensive report. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead then and move on uh, to city council member reports. And uh, Donnie, you're on the line. You want to go ahead and um, give give a report? Um, you bet. Well, I guess uh, as evidence of my non-video conferencing here, I have uh, been enjoying a little bit of uh, family time. So um, I wished I could say I miss everyone in brawling. <laughs> <laughs> ambient temperature i will openly admit for the record that i have been cold on numerous occasions up here in anchorage but uh, uh with that obviously enjoying our visit and um i i know i've been using the social media platform there a little bit but uh um really need to come up here and visit a couple of our our own uh brawlyites up here doing very well um serving our country up here and uh living uh uh, a pretty good life up in Anchorage. But other than that, no, I'm, I'm just always mindful of, uh, very grateful for all the work being done um, in and around the city. And I think some of the topics of our discussion uh, with this council meet, uh, this particular council meeting, very important. So uh, appreciate being able to zoom in from afar. This is definitely a first for me. So I don't know, Rosanna, if this is the first in Brawley council history of a council member <laughs> attending a meeting from over 2,000 miles away, but uh, pretty neat to do with technology. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really, really great. Very neat. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Councilman Morton. Continue enjoying Alaska. We're, we're, you're not missing much over here with the 115, 100. <laughs> well, actually, you were gone when it hit the highest, I think, like 118 or 119 yeah. this past week. So. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, moving on, uh, Councilman Couchman. I uh, don't have a whole lot to report. I've been around the city, uh, not much going on. It's been very warm. Uh, Walmart's doing a wild trade over there. They've got a lot of people there all the time. The day they were especially busy. Um, sounds like some of the businesses are doing okay still. Some are not. Um, I think uh, right now I see the city staff out there doing their job. We've got the work proceeding on Allen Street which I've kind of kept an eye on. Uh, I think they did something today and had a water outage for like a couple of hours or something. I'm not sure what happened. Um, and there's been some other things going on, but we're still continuing to do the work. I think everybody's progressing. It's nice to hear that some of the numbers with the COVID are at least going down somewhat. I want everybody to keep social distancing. I wear a mask everywhere that I go. 
I think that's important. Um, and with that, that's about all I really have to report. I do appreciate all the city staff being out there doing the job every day. I see the police department, fire department, and other members of the city staff out there on a constant basis and uh, appreciate all their efforts in that, in that way. And for everyone out there, it's been a slow week or so, so I don't know. Maybe it's just real quiet. So thanks very much. That's all I have to report. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Couchman. Uh, we'll move on to Councilman Nava. Well, thank you very much. Uh, in agreement, I mean, it's just been really hot. I know that, uh, you know, the, the heat certainly affects how many people are out on the streets. But uh, I do want to thank city staff for the work that they're doing. I do want to thank the public as well. And for those, of, um, for those that participated in the recent march, I do want to thank them um, for being peaceful and, and respectful and, and uh, certainly uh, appreciate their presence out there. So thank you all very much. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, I know that in the past, over the course of the start of this pandemic, we had you know, some Zoom uh, meetings and other things to help businesses. And, you know, as time has progressed, we've, we've maybe laid off of that. I would like to restart that and, and really focus in on some of the businesses that, that are still open and are able to um, uh, be in business. And so reemphasize to the public that those businesses are open and available uh, for them. You know, it's really difficult for, for a lot. I'm very fortunate that my business is, is um, you know, even though I have a, a, an office location, uh, most of what I do is um, over the internet and over, you know, uh, you know, using technology. And so not everybody's business is that way. Some have, you know, storefronts um, and some have um, restaurants where, you know, obviously they're, they're um, selling food. Um, so they're dependent on curbside pickups and, and to go orders and that sort of thing. But anything that we can do, to help promote local businesses, I think it's uh, within, you know, something we, we really need to focus in on. And uh, maybe we can take a few moments um, and talk about uh, some of the businesses that maybe you visit here as council members, and maybe we can shine some light on, on those. But uh, anyway, thanks to staff, thanks to the public, thanks to all the council members. I know it's it's been a challenge for all of us over the past several months. So thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Council Manala. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hamby. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't have a lot to report. I've uh, been doing a lot of work uh, in my personal business and it's, uh, you know, it's just tough to look out and see that, you know, so many businesses around the country are just, are really hurting or are not ever gonna be able to open back up while other industries are, you know, booming and don't have enough workers to, to keep up with the demand. And it's just an odd, situation to be in, but I'm grateful for the work that I have to do and and grateful to work in the city of Raleigh. Um, I was able to attend the end of July a, uh, a Chamber of Commerce board meeting by Zoom and um, there was some discussion about uh, cattle call and whether, you know, any of that can take place this year or not and I, so much is still up in the air. Um, but they're, they're discussing creative ways to try to get some of those events to still be able to be um, held in a safe way and uh, but they're rapidly approaching a date at which you know it's it's a go no go situation um, sometime in August when they when they'll have to decide to to uh, you know cut other things from the schedule but my hope and prayer is that as we see our numbers um, improve rapidly that um, that will maintain that trajectory and be able to hold some of these events that, that were looking like they weren't going to happen. Um, I also got to uh, participate in a patriotic parade um, of, of vehicles carrying American flags and, and drove through Raleigh and Intel Centro and back. And uh, it was a nice little get together and camaraderie with social distancing involved. Um, let's see. Like there was one other thing I wanted to add. Oh, um, you know, we we uh, we heard public comment earlier this evening about um, you know football leagues and and I understand that you know football probably has more contact than than most other sports anyway. So it's a very tough uh, it's a tough call. I I was impressed with the 
documentation that came along with that request and um, you know the measures that they're that they're expressing that they will take uh, to keep people as distance as possible and um, I think as our numbers improve of course we don't want to go backwards but it would be nice to be able to open up some of these restrictions and um, make it to where kids can can get out and participate together. I know so many of them got to be going stir crazy with cabin fever, being locked in and that kind of stuff. And, and the heat doesn't make it any easier, but hopefully we'll get some relief from the heat and, and from this virus and uh, can pick up and carry on some of the activities that have been off the table for so long. But um, I also want to echo those, those uh, words of gratefulness to the, city staff for the work that they're doing it's you know we're we're on a skeleton crew more so than we ever have been before i really appreciate the efforts of the finance team um, to bring in this new software uh package that will really move our city forward as far as you know just being able to to serve uh the customers that we have um and with that i uh, give it back to you madam mayor okay Thank you for that, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Um I just, uh, basically the past couple of weeks have been pretty quiet. Um, I have continued to participate and call in on the conference calls that are held uh, statewide from all departments. They just uh, pretty much provide an update of what's going on throughout the state with the testing, with the cases and positivity rates and if there's any changes and um, most of you probably are able to, to uh, catch up with the uh, governor's uh, presentations. And so if you, if you looked at that, they considered, they mentioned that Imperial was uh, kind of like Imperial plan. Um, they're following that our plan because they did so well as far as assisting Imperial County. Um, and now they're using that same plan to assist Central Valley because of, apparently there's uh, been quite a few cases up there with the farm worker community in Central Valley. So um, I, it, it feels good to be able to provide <laughs> some positive assistance that um, our numbers do look better. Uh, our positivity rate, as was reported, is coming down. Um, I think people are still concerned about the number of deaths, but uh, hopefully that number will also come down. And based on the report from Larry Lewis with PMH, it uh, sounds like there's less cases. And so it, it sounds positive. So I think that if we, um, you know, kind of hang on to that, things will get better. And hopefully soon we'll be able to see some of our businesses reopen and some of our parks and allow sports for our kids and so forth, like we talked about today. I did ask the question about the parks, uh, about the sports uh, from the public health department today. Uh, specifically because we had received that public comment and um, as far as our public health department is concerned at this time there's there's no change on on the, the direction for allowing uh, that type of activity but we'll stay on top of that and and share with all the parties that are that are um, interested in that and especially the schools we did also get um, contacted by uh, the rodeo committee uh, regarding the, uh, their, their event, uh, they still are planning. It seems like they have tentative plans to move forward, uh, but maybe it'll be a virtual rodeo. Uh, but um, it sounds like they are, their plan is to be positive and think that they will, we will have a rodeo this year in Brawley. So, um, that's that seems to be the direction that they're moving in and we offer to the city offer to help them in any way that we can to support that and um and i also want to thank rosanna and the police department and everyone that assisted with the uh march and vigil uh, that was held last saturday over here on our uh, kiosk for the um for marilyn casares uh they it was a peaceful uh, event. It went well, and uh, we. And I know that all the city we I, we showed our, our appreciation to all the community for their support, and uh, our sympathy 
and thoughts go out to all the family and friends of Marilyn Saris. And um, other than that, I think uh, that's about that's about all I have to report today. Thank you. So we'll move on to our city manager report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, two items of note. The first is that the uh, Imperial Valley Business Recovery Task Force uh, has launched a survey to gather information from open businesses. So it's, it's a very nice takeoff on some of the topics that Council Member Nava mentioned a little bit earlier today. Uh, that survey has been posted on the Hub and uh, the Imperial Valley Business Recovery Task Force has begun to do um, very focused uh, advertising to make others uh, out in the community at large across the county aware of businesses that are have their doors open um, and or are operating in modified ways and so um, all of our, our Brawley businesses are encouraged to participate in that process which is at no cost to, to uh, any of our, our local places of commerce. I wanted to also note that uh, the city today received a request from uh, the Marine Aviation Training Group that we uh, field a, a few times a year, typically in the city of Brawley. And uh, the form of the request is usually uh, hoping to use our uh, municipal airport for um, a ground uh, base operations that uh, support activity that are happening um, up in our skies. And the last um, time we received this request, which was a, a number of months ago, uh, but within the period of the emergency declaration, uh, it, it was a topic that the council uh, weighed in on in that um, they wanted, you wanted to be sure that the community at large was comfortable with the activity taking place with all the uncertainty uh, at that time. So I, what I uh, am hoping to do is uh, get some feedback from the council. This request date um, isn't until, uh, let's see, it's the end of September, but there's a lot of pre-planning that happens in advance with um, the parties. And typically, uh, there, there aren't major impacts. Um, there's visual impacts where you see uh, sometimes uniform personnel you know, uh, roving city limits, and there's limited noise-related impacts that we typically manage with a, uh, a timed uh, deadline for um, aircraft not flying uh, below a certain level by um, an, a, a particular evening hour. Um, the current request is to basically run for uh, a period of a few days from 12 p.m. to 11 p.m. And if, if the council would like to share any feedback with me tonight, I'm certainly open to receiving it. Or if you um, want to weigh in after this evening, I'd be happy to collect that input and feedback as we determine whether or not we will fulfill the request. Ros Rosanna, didn't we limit them to 9 p.m.? Or they were on the ground at 9 p.m.? Um, the last go around, we requested nine. What they uh, negotiated with us about was, I believe it was 10,000. They wouldn't uh, fly below 10,000 feet. Uh, but there, there is a uh, component of the training where operating in darkness is, is part of the activity. And because okay. at this time of year, there are still some issues with the time it gets dark um I talk at night you know, you know i got it yeah i got i got it yes absolutely um i i feel like that you know the climate has changed somewhat as far as the you know the tension and i i would be fine with them having their activities their training activities here yeah i think that was our concern last time and i don't i don't have those concerns this time around either so i'm fine with them having their activities Okay, I thank you too. very much. That's helpful feedback. Okay. And with that, I have nothing further to report. Okay, thank you, Rosanna. Uh, moving on to city attorney report. Uh, uh, city attorney here. I'm up in Port Townsend, Washington. I'm not as far away as Council Member Warden, <laughs> but I'm pretty far away. And yeah. it's a lot cooler here. It's probably 72. 
Oh, anyway, nice. uh, nice. but I, I've been in constant contact, it seems, with uh, personnel director and chief of police, and and things are still getting done, even though I'm here. So that's okay. that's about good, it. Good. Thank you. Uh, city clerk report. Uh, nothing to report at this time, according to our city clerk. Okay, okay then um, okay. If there's nothing else that concludes our this part of our meeting and we'll go ahead and go into closed session. And Rosanna, you will email us the phone number for us to call in. It should be in your inbox. Okay, and okay. you need like five minutes, 10 minutes. What do you Five. Five minutes, is that good? Okay, Perfect. we'll call in in five minutes. Thank you all out there very much for listening in and thank you council and attorney and staff for your time and dedication. Thank you okay, everyone. We'll call thank, you. thank you. All right.